Well, good afternoon, everyone. I think we should make a start since it's uh, a little past the uh, time of the seminar. The Waterloo Institute for Nanotechnology is pleased to welcome Professor Uttanda Raman Sundaraj of the Department of Chemical and Petroleum Engineering at the University of Calgary as our first WIN seminar speaker for February 2012. Uh, Dr. Sundaraj was, uh, was born into a family of engineers. His father was a civil engineer and his uncle was an engineer in the Indian Army. So he developed a passion for engineering at a very early age and of course he's kept that up throughout his career as you'll hear shortly. He obtained his BSc in Chemical Engineering at the University of Alberta and a PhD in Polymer Engineering at the University of Minnesota in 1994. He then spent uh, four years in R&D at General Electric Plastics and appeared at DuPont Central Experimental Station before returning to the University of Alberta as an associate professor. And he moved to Calgary in 2008 as professor and head of his Department of Chemical and Petroleum Engineering. Dr. Sundaraj's main research interests are in polymer blends and nanocomposites, structure generation in twin screw extruders, and modeling of polymer processes. Uh, his recent work has involved the creation of hybrid nanocomposites using novel nanofillers like copper nanowires, carbon nanotubes, and nanoclays, and this is the subject, uh, as you see, of this talk today. In 2003, uh, he received the Polymer Processing Society's Morand Lambler Award for outstanding research in polymer processing, and in 2006 was awarded a Humboldt Research Fellowship, uh, which he took up in Germany, of course. Dr. Sundaraj is an outstanding teacher uh, who has been recognized many times for teaching excellence. Among his teaching awards are the Rutherford Award for Excellence in Undergraduate Teaching in 2005, which is the highest teaching honor at the University of Alberta, an Excellence in Education Award in 2007 from the Association of Professional Engineers, Geologists, and Geophysicists of Alberta, uh, the Medal of Distinction for Engineering Education in 2008 from the Canadian Council of Professional Engineers, and the 3M Teaching Fellowship in 2010, uh, the National University Teaching Honor that embodies the highest ideals of teaching excellence and scholarship uh, in Canada. He's given over 25 plenary <coughs> keynote presentations at major conferences and has won several Best Paper Awards at major international and national conferences. So please welcome an outstanding scholar, Dr. Utanga Raman Sundaraj. Thank you very much. I don't know where you got all that. It's a good job. So maybe I'll just first start off by thanking Dr. Cardi and the uh, uh, Waterloo Institute of Nanotechnology for the uh, invitation. And also, I want to commend Dr. Cardi. A lot of those things he said I didn't know about myself as well. So uh, I didn't give him any bio, so I'm not sure how he came up with it. But that's really quite amazing, especially about my uncle being in the Indian Army as well. So I really commend you on that. Um, also, it's very nice for me to be uh, here in Waterloo. Uh, I have some old friends here from uh, the, uh, you know, maybe about the 1990s, early 1990s, and uh, of course some new friends as well here, so it's really a pleasure to be here. So uh, what I'm gonna do today is uh, talk about some of the recent work we've been doing at the um, uh, University of Calgary related to using metal nanowires mainly, but also carbon nanotubes to try and look at electromagnetic interference shielding applications. And before I start, I should just uh, mention uh, some of the folks that are here on the, uh, uh, chart here. So Hanaro Helvez is a uh, research associate that's working uh, in, in the group. Uh, Mohamed Arjman is a PhD student. Uh, Mohamed Al Saleh is a uh, uh, former student who's now a professor at uh, Jordan University Science and Technology. And Joyce Chow is uh, a student, a master student that's just in the process of finishing right now. So um, to start off with, I always try and give people, uh, especially if I'm going internationally, uh, a little bit of a background about Calgary and the University of Calgary. Um, of course, uh, it's mostly in the U.S. that I need to tell them that, uh, that uh, these Calgary's near the Rocky Mountains, uh, because you know, when I go to Germany or Brazil or Iran, they know. But then when I'm in you know, Montana or in New York, they're like, oh, okay, so that's, you know, yeah, they, they're that close to Toronto, is the first question. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so let me go back to that one, sorry. I guess there it goes. Okay, so uh, of course you know you know the population, uh, but that size of Calgary is actually quite huge. Maybe some people don't know. It's really quite spread out. 
And one interesting fact, it has the most engineers per capita in North America. So we just beat out Houston. So actually, you know, what, what I tell people is that, you know, if you're in Calgary and you spit on the road, you're probably going to hit an engineer as you're going by. So we have, and the reason, of course, is because there's so much of the uh, industry, especially in the petroleum and uh, petrochemical. Um, our, our university uh, is fairly new, um, a little bit younger, I think, than Waterloo. Waterloo is also fairly new. Uh, we have 30,000 students. Uh, we're going to be celebrating our 50th anniversary, 2016. So uh, we have some celebrations uh, ready for that. And uh, in our department, which is chemical and petroleum engineering, currently we have about 500 undergraduate students. And we have 380 plus graduate students. So we really have quite a, a large ratio. I mean, it's still less than one, but we have quite a large ratio of graduate to undergraduate. And the faculty number is very similar to the one here, a little bit lower, I think, than the uh, complement uh, for uh, chemical engineering here at Waterloo. So. Just to get into uh, just some basics, I think for this crowd, I don't really need to say very much, but you know, we have many different types of nanoparticles, and really the idea is that we can somehow take these nanoparticles or nanofibers or nanowires and then put them into um, some uh, or graphene or you know, clay or layered materials. We can put them into polymers and try and have some enhanced properties of the polymers. And because the particle size is so low, we have uh, a very high surface area to volume, and then the idea is that maybe we can get better dispersions, get our be better properties for these polymer nanocomposites. Of course, in a lot of cases, we have the opposite effect because of the very high, uh, you know, interparticle forces that are keeping the materials together. So we have to kind of work on that to try and get, I won't say the best dispersion, but I'll say an optimum dispersion, especially when we start looking at things like electrical properties. So when we start to look at electrical properties, one of the key aspects or key properties is the electrical conductivity, and that occurs in these polymer nanocomposites when we add these conductive nanofillers when we get a percolated network. So essentially all these nano uh, fibers or nano uh, particles will connect together in some type of network so that we can have um, some conductivity through that network. Based on that, instead of looking at the nano spheres or nanoparticles, we are looking more at the nanotubes or nanofibers or nanowires because we can load those at lower concentrations and still be able to get higher, or, uh, higher um, uh, conductivities with very low percolation threshold. So this is a picture, this is actually uh, Sumio Ejima, who's the uh, fellow who discovered carbon nanotubes, and just some schematics of uh, showing what uh, single wall, multi-wall nanotubes might look like. The wonderful aspect of these nanomaterials is uh, some of the properties that we can get. Um, say for single wall or multi-wall nanotubes compared to stainless steel, you can see we have much, much higher Young's modulus and tensile strength. And even compared to engineering uh, thermoplastics, uh, Kevlar fibers are really well known for their high strength. But even compared to that, you know, we can see that the actual carbon nanotube by itself has higher properties. Of course, and also on the electrical uh, uh, property side as well, carbon nanotubes are known very well for that. But of course, the issue is that once you take those from being the single nanotube or nanoparticle, uh, and then you disperse that inside another matrix to make it into something that can be more useful, then we may not necessarily get that tensile strength. We may not necessarily get that uh, current density, because now you have a mixture of two materials. What we've looked at in our labs is the metal nanowires much more. And uh, we have the capability to make metal nanowires of all different types. Um, you know, we have some, we've made some gold, but you know, with the recent prices, we've kind of stopped on making more of those. No. Really, it, it's a matter of, uh, it does have some very good applications. In fact, Dr. Uh, Lee, uh, who's here, has worked on uh, gold nanoparticles for some uh, very specific uh, applications, but the expense, of course, is, is a consideration. Silver is also very interesting, especially for uh, uh, anything with the biomedical or uh, uh, medical applications. Uh, platinum we haven't worked with, uh, palladium we haven't worked with. We have made nickel and copper, silver and gold uh, nanowires. And we're also working with, say, you could also use this method that we're, I'm, I'm going to show for uh, electrically conductive polymer materials as well to make nanowires of them. We make them with the idea that we're going to put them into polymers, and these polymer composites can potentially have much better properties, especially in terms of electromagnetic interference shielding. So this really has to do with you know, your cell phones, laptop enclosures. You know, there's some um, reports that have come out. Uh, one of the recent reports from the World Health Organization indicates that 
excessive cell phone use can uh, lead to tumors, cancers, um, and also there was a French study that came out a few years ago that said that um, I think they were studying children under five or six and um, if the children had excessive cell phone use that their brain patterns actually shifted and were different than children that didn't have uh, excessive cell phone use. Of course, my main question was why are these children under six having excessive cell phone use? That's a different, that's a different study. However, uh, it is very clear that these uh, radiation that's going on with our laptops, with our personal portable electronics, could be potentially an issue for us health-wise. And so the best thing to do is to try and limit as much as possible the interference or the radiation that goes into and out of the, uh, the parts. So for a cell phone, also you don't want any um, uh, radiation going in because that can affect the device functionality. So um, that's a, a big focus of what we're working on in our group. We can also look at lower um, uh, conductivities as such and look at electro uh, electronic electrostatic discharge protection for packaging and other uh, applications, sensors. And also when we look at the aircrafts or helicopters, um, when we have lightning strike on a helicopter that can create issues with the instruments and then the helicopter can crash. So usually what they have is kind of a, a wire mesh uh, through it that allows for that uh, lightning strike to be dissipated. But if we could now make something that has more of a, a polymer composite type of structure as a very thin film that could still have the same type of uh, uh, property or same type of impact, however, it would be much lighter than the metal. So that could be another potential use as well. So. There are lots of different nanofillers have been uh, coming up over the last few years, and some of the major ones are carbon nanotubes, vapor-grown carbon nanofibers, graphene nanosheets, and metal nanowires. And uh, so these are some of the sizes here. So you can see carbon nanotubes, obviously, we can get to very low, but also have some multi-wall uh, vapor-grown carbon nanofibers, a little bigger. Of course, by your definitions, depending on what your definition is, you might say, no, these are not nano. They're above nano scale, but you know, around that scale. Of course, graphene nanosheets have been getting a lot of uh, interest lately. The metal nanowires that we make in our group are on uh, the order of 25 nanometers in diameter. And the key thing for, as we'll get into later, is the aspect ratio is also important when we start to look at their potential for electrical conductivity applications. So we can have extremely high aspect ratios, like a million or a thousand, or you know, around that range, and that can be quite important, as I'll show later. The electrical conductivities of the pure materials, obviously, are also very high. And we can see here the graphene nanosheets are the highest, but then the metal nanowires like copper and so on are also quite high. Uh, carbon nanotubes are, are, are you know, closely behind. The vapor-grown carbon nanofibers are, are, are lower, but then on the thermal conductivity side, they're actually a little bit better than the carbon nanotubes um, for nanocomposites. Some of the ch key challenges that we're having uh, with these, obviously, is that we have an inorganic material that we're then trying to put in with this organic polymer. And the chemistry between that in that interface is extremely critical. So a lot of the work really has to go into that as to how can we get that chemistry to bridge the gap between that uh, nanofiller and the uh, organic polymer. The cost of the nanofiller is another issue, but when you look at something like carbon nanotubes, I remember back in you know, 2002 or so, I was buying these uh, nanotubes, and they were from Russia because they were cheaper, and actually came out mostly being soot. But anyway, it was about. Uh, I believe about $1,000 to $2,000 per gram, which was cheap because I couldn't afford the uh, four or $5,000 version. But now these are being sold, these nanotubes are, are being sold at about $40 or $50 a kilogram. So we've had the technology now to scale these up, make, uh, make it cheaper. So I think in, if we have the right applications, we can make it economically feasible, but it's obviously an issue when you first start out. Um, Processing and the high viscosity, when you add these materials, the, the materials, uh, the polymer viscosity becomes high and processing is a concern. One of the other big concerns is the safe handling of nanofillers because probably many of you, well, maybe not all of you, but some of you may have heard of the asbestos and how asbestos is bad for you and so everything is banned from being asbestos. I had um, a Toyota Camry in 1996, I still have it. You know, you know how professors are, right? They never change their car until it actually dies and you have to uh, you know, push it to the uh, off the cliff, but um, the Camry, I had my brakes on that Camry for 12 years. So it was amazing. Nobody would believe that uh, you know, brakes would last for 12 years, but part of it is because they used asbestos in the formulation of those brakes, and asbestos is a wonderful material. It's fantastic, but of course, if it gets in the air, then you can have problems with breathing it in, you know, lung cancers, other things. It's 
it doesn't have anything to do with necessarily the asbestos. It really has to do with the size scale. So it's the same with these other nano um, you know, tubes or nano wires and so on that if you have these, you have to be very careful in how you handle it because if it does get in the air and get into your lungs, it can be an issue. So that's another aspect we look at. So now what we do always is before we take the material out, we put it into a master batch, into a polymer, so it can't go into the air. So it's either in solution or it's in a polymer. It's never actually free by itself. I do have some free stuff in my bag uh, because one of the professors here who's, I don't see him here, but I'm going to meet him later, is going to be uh, uh, wanting to do something with them. But uh, usually we don't take it that way. We uh, normally try and make sure that it's safer to handle. So unless you really know what you're doing, it's important to be, uh, um, to careful, be careful with these. All right. So here's a uh, plot showing the different um, conductivities for different materials. So metals are very, very conductive. And of course, polymers are not. So the idea that we have is to mix these so that we can get you know, different types of conductivities. We could get into some lower conductivities and have dissipative nanocomposites get into higher where we have conductive, and when we get close to the kind of the metal conductivity, then we can have the electromagnetic interference shielding. So we really have to get to very high conductivities to be able to do that. And we're uh, looking mainly at uh, silver and copper, but I'm going to mainly present about copper today. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So this is the electrical percolation curve for um, uh, when we have a polymer with some nanofiller. What you can see here, when you have very low concentration, so these are the polymer chains, and of course the polymer is insulative, so there's no conductivity. As you add the nanofiller, you, uh, this conductive material, you can see that maybe there's a slight increase, but really until there's any connections made, there's not any significant change in the electrical conductivity, and this is on a log scale here. But once those connections start to be made, and you form this network of these uh, nano, uh, these nanofillers, then you can have then the electrons going from one side of the sample to the other side. And at that concentration where that network forms, you have this huge increase in the percolation or in the um, uh, electrical conductivity, and that's called the percolation threshold where that starts to occur. So we can go from, say, 10 to the 14th, as I mentioned, or sorry, 10 to the negative 14th for polymers, all the way up to, say, 10 to the second. So, like, you know, 15 orders of magnitude type of change in electrical conductivity. I'll also show some plots as we're going through this talk today of the resistivity, which is essentially the same thing, it just shows the inverse plot, but again, you can see where the percolation occurs. So um, again, you have you know, a very high resistivity here when there's no connections. Once you make the connections, you have very low um, uh, resistivity. The other key thing is that the percolation threshold, this concentration where that occurs, we want to keep that as low as possible because obviously the material is more expensive than the polymer, so we don't want to add a lot of it. But secondly, as you add the material into the polymer, we lose all the inherent um, material properties that we like. You know, that we lose the processing capability to be able to mold it into any shape. We lose the flexibility, you know, we lose ductility. We lose a lot of things that we normally want polymers for by adding too much. So we want to add as little as possible. And um, that amount can be reduced by changing the aspect ratio. As we go to higher and higher aspect ratios, we can get um, lower percolation threshold. And if we take a look at different shapes, so theoretically, if you had a statistically random type of distribution, when we have spheres, which have an aspect ratio of 1, you need 16 volume percent of material to get percolation. But if you have cylinders, which have a length over diameter of 1,000, then you would only need 0 0.05 volume percent. If you remember the carbon nanotubes, the uh, metal nanowires, these other materials, they had those as kind of aspect ratios. So we can really reduce the amount quite a bit. Of course, this is theoretical. So here's a sample uh, percolation curve for polystyrene with multi-wall nanotubes. Aye. Okay. So maybe at the very beginning, we might have this type of structure where these nanotubes are kind of distributed throughout the entire matrix. And what that really uh, simulates is kind of like uh, several capacitors here. So it's possible for us to have some uh, increase in the conductivity or some reduction in the resistivity in this case, but it's really not that much. Now, as we start to add more and more of the nano uh, tubes here, we'll get to a stage where we start to make the first connections. Now the electrons can really get through the matrix quite easily, and that's where this percolation starts to occur, when these first connections starts to, make, starts to be made. And then as you add more and more material and more and more of these nanotubes, you'll get then multiple connections, and then you can have then a lot of 
uh, electrical current flowing. After this point, you can see as you add more and more nanotubes, there's not really that much of a difference. There's some difference, but it kind of reaches a plateau. Okay. So in our group, what we do is a lot of uh, processing of polymer materials. So what we're really interested in is how can we take a certain mixture of polymers or polymers and filler, and how can we create a certain structure that will then uh, create a certain type of property that we're looking for. So we're always trying to see the relationship between the blending process, morphology, and then finally to the properties. So in this case, we have a case of, uh, this is a nylon rubber blend, where we are changing the processing, and by changing the processing, uh, we can say for this 10 weight percent concentration, we get to a point where we get a smaller particle size, and at that smaller particle size and lower, we get a much higher impact strength. So by changing the processing, we can get a different morphology, which then leads to better properties. And you can see here actually you have uh, 10, 15, 25% rubber concentrations, and you see that each one has a specific um, uh, con or particle size where there's a huge jump in the impact strength in this case. And you might say, why is it based on the difference? If it's the particle size is the critical parameter, why is there a difference? Well, really the particle size is not the critical parameter. It's actually the distance between particles, or that interligament thickness that's the most important parameter. So when we have the same interligament thickness, or certain interligament thickness, we go from a very low impact strength, and lower than a certain ligament thickness, we have a high impact strength. And if you plotted the same plot versus the ligament thickness, rather than the particle size, you'll see that all three of these curves, the different concentrations, will overlap on each other. Okay, so there is a way for us to be able to control the properties by looking at the right structure. To get that structure, we want to do certain type of processing to create that structure. So this is a twin screw extruder. Um, so this one is uh, actually at 3M Laboratories. It's their experimental extruder, and it's a 50 millimeter, and it requires about 25 to 200 pounds per hour to run through there. So when we first started out uh, on this, um, I think we're making on the order of about 10 micrograms per three-day cycle. So we're just doing some calculations to see how can we get to that 200 pound an hour rate. Well, it wasn't going to work. So what we had to do is, even though this was quite important, we had to find a way to make something on the smaller scale. So I'll talk a little bit later about how we're doing uh, smaller scale mixing that simulates what happens on these large scale um, extruders. And I think you have some of these extruders in uh, Dr. Soganakis's labs here, and uh, so you may be familiar with it. But here's uh, another extruder that's actually at DuPont, and this is a nice extruder because we can put a glass plate, or actually a, it's a quartz plate on the extruder, and we can see how the mixing occurs. So I'll give you a little bit of a video here that shows, uh, so essentially we're only looking at the very, very last part of this extrusion, where we have here a polystyrene and a polypropylene mixture, 80% polystyrene that's added and then mixed and uh, melted as it goes through the extruder. So I'll just run this, hopefully it works here. So what you see is that initially when we start off, we have this solid salt and pepper type of mixture of polystyrene and polypropylene. And as you go down the mixer, or the extruder, you see that it's the polystyrene starts to melt, and then you have this kind of uh, still solid polypropylene, which then also quickly melts, and then you have what looks at the end here to be this homogeneous mixture of uh, the final blend. But actually, at this stage, we actually have micron size or submicron size polypropylene inside polystyrene. But we can't see it because of the wavelength of light. But this is the same structure that I was showing earlier where we had that impact strength and we showed the different morphology. So that's what's going on there. So it's very important for us to be able to understand what's going on during this process and how can we control that final structure that occurs. Yeah. So because we require too much material to run um, uh, you know, our blends or nano composites through those machines, we started to look at, can we look at some smaller scale mixers? And there's um, these three different companies that make essentially the same mixer. Uh, the DSM, DACA, and Thermohaka mixers, which require about five to 15 milliliters. The only um, difference between the DSM DACA versus the Haka machine, or the Thermohaka machine, is that that Thermohaka machine requires, uh, sorry, is a uh, horizontal, and the other two are vertical in their orientation. Otherwise, exact same design. So the reason they did it horizontal is because they want to get around the patent for the other, the other mixer. So. so, but even then, you were looking at about five to 15 grams of material that we require. We still felt that was too much. So what we decided to do in our group was to try and create our own mixer, which incorporated all the facets of what you'd have in a twin screw extruder, 
So we have shear flow, elongational flow, folding. Like when you think about uh, some of the kneading blocks in the extruder, these extruders were initially set up to make things like bread dough or sausage. So the kneading action that's there is, is the folding like you do when you make bread. So that's also an important part of the mixing. And you also have some splitting and joining of streams. So our idea was to take something that's a small mixer, like something like this miniature, or sorry, Minimax mixer, which is used in a lot of polymer chemistry labs, and essentially this is just a cylinder inside a cup, and something like, uh, that also has the abilities of this internal batch mixer, which requires about 60 s grams or so. But what we wanted was the mixing capability of this, but the size scale of this, which is around one gram. So we wanted to put that together and try and make a new type of mixer. And I should also say that this Minimax mixer, I'm going to say some bad things about it that doesn't mix well and so on. So I should first clarify that the Max in there is actually for Bryce Maxwell from Princeton, who is uh, my academic grandfather. So I don't want to say anything bad about him. So I should point out that when he published the paper, which was, I think, 1970, um, he did not call it the Minimax mixer. He called it the Minimax molder. He was really wanting to use it to uh, melt polymer and then mold it into a certain shape. It was only for melting. But then as people wanted to use smaller and smaller volumes for mixing, they started to use the Minimax molder as the Minimax mixer, but maybe not really what it was intended for. So what we came up with was uh, it's called the uh, asymmetric mini mixer. And so it has a similar size scale, about one gram required to do the mixing. But the difference is this asymmetric rotor that we have here. So essentially, this rotor will fit inside the cup with the polymer and then mix, and then we can take the sample out. But the rotor design is, such, is like this. So it has actually, uh, this is the center, it has kind of a, you know, kind of a, uh, a medium gap, large gap, and then a very small, narrow gap. And as you can see, the shear rates vary quite a bit inside that mixer. This is very similar to what you'd expect in an extruder as well. You have varying shear rates. And also in here, as you're going in between the, these different gaps, you're having extensional flow as through this converging, diverging flow. And then on top of that, because of this helical cut that we put along the axial um, direction, we also get flow up and down the extruder, uh, up and down the, the, the instrument. So this way we can get all the things that we normally get. We didn't, because it's only one rotor, we may not really expect any folding, because normally you need two rotors to get that folding effect. But otherwise, it has all the aspects of a twin screw extruder. Yeah, so this is just a little plug saying it's available. So I'll just leave that. The other mixer that we made was the um, mini batch mixer. So it's very similar to the large mixer, but now we're making it on the uh, you know, two to three milliliter scale. And that's a Canadian dime to give you an idea of the, uh, the size scale. So you can just do the same thing that you would with the normal batch mixer, add the material in here, mix it, take it apart, take your samples, do your testing. Okay. So we did some uh, numerical simulations of these. And uh, maybe I'll start off here with this particular, um, with the, uh, what we call the APAM, or the asymmetric mini mixer. And what's really interesting here, so this is a plane for that simulation, uh, and what we did was we released a particle on that plane. And what we found was very interesting. Initially, the particle actually started to go up, and then it wound up getting folded back and forth. This is something we didn't expect at all, because we only have one rotor. But because of these different size gaps, we have different pressures. And actually, because of that, we wind up getting folding as well inside this, ex inside this machine. And if I run the simulation, it gives you an idea. Not only do we have that folding, we also have that flow around the axial and, sorry, flow uh, along the axial and around the circumferential direction. So we get all of this activity going on just with that very simple single rotor mixer. And then, of course, the batch mixer, the mini batch mixer, does the same thing as the um, batch mixer. I know it's flashing here, but anyway, we have here in the center, we have some axial flow, and again, we have the converging, diverging flow, so we get extensional shear and folding occurring here. This is a uh, video just to uh, show some of the aspects of the, uh, uh, the mixing. And so this is a uh, polystyrene, sorry, the polycarbonate uh, red phase at the bottom. And this transparent phase is the sil is silicon PDMS. And so as we uh, start the mix, you can see the polycarbonate is higher density, so it's at the bottom. But then as we start rotating, you can see it's starting to go up that rotor. And this is over a period of about five minutes. And you can see now it's actually all particles are distributed quite well throughout the entire mixer. And then after about five minutes of mixing, you can see almost a homogeneous looking red color throughout the entire 
mixer. So um, that just gives you an idea of you know, some of the things that we saw in the simulation, we also could see in visualization. So to compare the flow in this, uh, this mixer versus what a lot of people are using, which is the Minimax mixer, you can see here that we see converging, diverging flows, axial flow, folding, and reorientation, so everything that happens in a twin screw extruder. But here, in the Minimax, we see that this is basically just rotational flow. So the particle starts off at one radial location and one axial location and stays in the same spot throughout the entire mixing. So when people do this and then they say, well, we don't get good properties, well, no wonder, right? So it's very important that when you're trying to do new materials development that you use the right type of mixing. Because if you use, let's say you had a fantastic material, you know, you had made some new nanomaterial, you mixed it with some polymer, and then it was, could have been very fantastic, but then you did poor mixing on it, and then you said, oh no, this is garbage, and you threw it away. Now you've just thrown away something that could have been potentially very valuable. So it's very important that when you're doing the mixing on the small scale, that it simulates what can happen on the large scale. In the same way also, you don't want to do too well or do something that's different than what would be in the large scale because you might see something on a large scale and then you can't scale it up and that happens too. So it has to be very, you have to be very careful to have something on the smaller scale that matches the larger scale. So maybe I'll show some results with some of the mixings that we've done with, uh, this is the first uh, with polycarbonate with um, carbon nanotubes that's in a master batch. So we have a master batch of polycarbonate uh, that's mixed with just pure polycarbonate. And these uh, multi-wall nanotubes are about 10 to 15 nanometer diameter and about 10 to 15 microns length. So that's about a uh, 1,000 aspect ratio. So when we did this mixing, we did this in the three different mixers. We did it in the uh, DACA or DSM machine, which is available uh, commercially. And then our two mixers, the APAM, uh, which is the asymmetric mini mixer, and the MBM, which is that mini batch mixer. And what we see is that when we look at the percolation threshold, or the resistivity versus the uh, content of uh, multi-wall nanotubes, the concentration, the percolation concentration for the DACA machine is about 1%. But if we do the mixing in the asymmetric mini mixer or the mini batch mixer, it's actually about 0.75% or lower. So by just changing the mixing, we've now reduced the amount of material required to be able to get that percolation. And then we see at the end that the actual concentration um, or sorry, the actual um, final uh, resistivity is about the same. So after some time, we get there. Now the other interesting as the, uh, part that I'm not showing here, but if for when we did the same experiment with the Hakka machine, which is exactly the same. Remember that thermal Hakka machine is exactly the same design as the other, except instead of vertical, it was in a horizontal orientation. And by changing the orientation, we've gone from 1% to 2%. So you've doubled just by changing orientation. So mixing is very, very important to consider. So when you look at the percolation, um, uh, we can use a percolation theory to calculate the actual percolation threshold. And also this T value, this T value tells us a little bit about the type of structure. So you know, as you get more uh, dimensions to your structure, the T value will go up. So that'll usually mean that'll uh, lead to a lower uh, percolation threshold. And if we do that for the data there, what we see is actually uh, it's not 0.75, it's about 0.64. Uh, percent and the T value is about two when we do the, uh, the fit on the power law. So this gives us an idea of um, uh, you know, what, what, when the percolation occurs and what type of structure is, is, is present. Now again, going back to processing, if we take the material that's made and then we do different things to it, we can compression mold it or we can do injection molding. Now, of course, injection molding is very nice because we can do uh, much quicker samples, make, make it cheaper. However, the percolation threshold for the compression molded versus the injection molding is quite different. And the reason is because when we do the compression molding, we can have much more random uh, orientation of our materials and have a potential to have conductive uh, networks form. And when we do injection molding, we get a lot more orientation. And once you orient those, it's less likely that those different uh, nanowires or nanoparticles can, or sorry, yeah, nanotubes can connect with each other. So it's also, again, when we start looking at injection molding, by changing the operating conditions, we can also change where that percolation occurs. So processing can be quite important. So getting to our technology, our technology is really the metal nanowires. So we're making nanowires of uh, cop copper, silver, gold, whatever. Mostly copper is what I'm going to present here. And so these materials are very um, electrically conductive and have high surface area. Aspect ratios are about 100. We actually can make them over 100, up to 1,000. And we will show here that we also can get very low percolation thresholds for these materials. 
So these are some of the nanowires that we've made. So they're about 25 nanometer diameter. And uh, like when, when they're first made, they're probably are on the order of close to uh, you know, a few hundred to thousand aspect ratio. Um, so they also have very high electroconductivity and good purity. And the key thing is that their uh, properties electrically for each one of these nanowires is very consistent. So sample to sample, nanowire to nanowire, very consistent in terms of their properties. So when we uh, make these, the way we make them is using what we call a hard template method or aluminum, uh, porous aluminum oxide template. And so first what we do is we make this template, which is kind of this honeycomb type of structure with these pores that are about 25 nanometers in diameter, but very, very deep, you know, microns in length potentially. And so here's a uh, SEM showing these 25 nanometer diameter um, holes or these pores. And these are some of the conditions that were used to make them. And the way we make the actual template is we start off with just the electropolished aluminum. We do an anodization process. And this anodization process, of course, you know, like people like Alcan and others were doing this 40, 50 years ago. But when you do the first anodization, what happens is that you get a very, very disordered type of structure. But the bottom of the pores are actually quite ordered, and they have this kind of hexagonal type of uh, arrangement. So then we take that uh, disordered type of uh, uh, template and we take away the top layer and then we have this kind of texture, this dimple type of structure. And then we start to do the anodization again and we do that anodization. Now it grows very, very regularly. We can make these cylindrical pores that are several microns deep if needed. So to make the actual nanowires, as I mentioned, we first we synthesize a template and then we use uh, AC to uh, electro deposition, so we deposit the copper into this, uh, or silver, or whatever else, into the pores. And uh, we could also try and look at DC. Uh, a lot of people use DC. Of course, there you'd have to remove that barrier layer at the bottom of the template. And uh, then the other uh, problem with the DC is that it's harder to get high, long, uh, high aspect ratios, or very long pores. And secondly, it's very hard to scale up. So you'll see that most of the publications are using DC methods for this. They're usually dealing with like micrograms or maybe milligrams, whereas we're into the kind of the grams or tens of grams. So the scale up is much easier for the AC method. So after we make the, uh, uh, the do the filling, uh, we can remove the extra deposition here. Oh, I should mention the difference between AC and DC. The reason a lot of people use DC is because the filling is much more regular. So it, all the pores grow at the same rate. When you do AC, they kind of grow more randomly. So you have different lengths, uh, different pores have different amounts of deposition. So what we do is we over deposit so that all the pores have you know, more uh, copper. And then we remove that bulk deposition, liberate it, and then we can take that and put it right into, take these nanowires, put them in the polymer nanocomposite. Or we can also surface functionalize and then put them into the nanocomposite. So here's a picture of one of our cells. So this particular cell can make uh, about one gram per process cycle, which is around three days. And uh, here's a picture of the aluminum foil that we use. And this is right after the um, anodization. So you can see kind of that rainbow effect because the nanostructure. And then after we deposit the carbon, uh, sorry, the copper um, into it, you can see that the copper is in here. And then we can liberate that copper and have the nanowires. We have scaled this up to five grams. And uh, we're just in the process of uh, putting in the 30 gram machine. So here's uh, some of the, the different um, cells that we're using. And of course, these are all batch. And our next step now is to go to the continuous process. So these are some of, uh, again, some properties of the silver and uh, copper nanowires. Um, so it gives you some idea. This is for the, um, the, the first cell that I showed. Um, so this gives you 25 nanometer diameter and uh, about one plus to one to two uh, microns uh, length, which gives us L over D is of about 100. So we are at the stage now, not quite at 1,000, but we're at the 100 aspect ratio. So hopefully we can really reduce the aspect, or sorry, the, uh, the percolation threshold to well below 1%. So uh, here's another uh, thing that we do to try and make our master batch. So to make our master batch, we use this uh, technique where we have the nanowires and the polystyrene are mixed together in a miscible solvent. And then we add a non-solvent. And when we add that non-solvent, the polystyrene or the polymer starts to precipitate out of that solution. And as it precipitates, what happens is that these nanowires start to coat these particles that are coming out of solution. 
So then, at the end, we have this kind of uh, powder that has nano uh, wires coated on them. And finally, what we can do is we can take that and add it with other just pure polymer and do compression molding and get a structure that might have you know, some good network properties. We call this the MSMP method, or miscible solvent mixing and precipitation. And the nice thing about this is we don't need to do anything special to the polymer. We're actually using the process to create a structure. So to give you an idea of what the morphology looks like, so this is the, all the particles after the precipitation has occurred. And if we take a look at a close-up of one of those particles, you can see there there's a particle of polystyrene with some nanowires nicely coated on the surface. And then we take that and we can also do a, um, a TEM. So this is, uh, you know, it's not stained. So the outside actually is epoxy and the particle has been embedded in epoxy. And here's the inside, it's polystyrene and you can see the copper nanowires are coating the outside. Of course, this is a two-dimensional image. So you can imagine in the three-dimensional, this is actually kind of more like a network. All these things are connected together. If we take that and do the compression molding, and now this is a mixture of both that, uh, those particles and just pure particles of uh, polystyrene. What you can see is that we've been able to form these networks, and these networks uh, actually can have these connections of one uh, copper nanowire to another copper nanowire. So when we take a look at this, if we have an electron trying to move through here, you can see that there's a, a way for them to get through. So now we've created a structure that has very nice electrical properties, but at the same time, you see that most of the sample doesn't have any filler at all. You know, all these inside parts here, they have no filler. It's only this, these kind of quote unquote interfaces that have the filler. So in terms of filling, we don't need to fill. This is at 0% nano wires there, and this has you know, much higher concentrations. But overall, we can have a much lower concentration of nano filler required because the network is only at the interface. It's not at the inside parts. Okay. So when we did that, and compared, uh, we also you know, just did pure solution processing. So just take the solution, put things together, mix it. Should be mixed very well. We get um, a uh, percolation at about 1%. When we do this dry mixing and compression molding, then we get actually around 0.25%. Um, so the percolation, we've now been able to reduce it another four times down. So by using the um, uh, different mixing methods and different types of processing, we can actually change the type of properties that we can get. Now the other interesting thing that you may or may not be able to see here is the um, values that we're getting here for the, uh, this is the resistivity, but the values are very close to metal type of conductivities. So now we can really start to look at our electromagnetic interference shielding. So here's some um, plots here using that method for both the multi-wall nanotube and for the copper nanowires. For the multi-wall nanotubes, and I should probably point out that uh, the zero is actually here, so the plot is made so we you know, can see the points. The multi-wall nanotube has a very, very quick percolation and then kind of levels off. It takes longer for the copper nanowires to be percolated, but then they get to much higher values. So that can be adv advantageous as well. So when we see the percolation thresholds for these using the percolation theory, we see the copper nanowires are about 0.67 for the percolation to occur. And the multi-wall carbon nanotubes are 0.05 volume percent. If you remember back, that 0.05 was the theoretical uh, prediction for a uh, 1,000 aspect ratio, which is what these carbon nanotubes are. So it, uh, it appears that by using this method, we can get actually very, very low percolation thresholds and very, very high values of conductivity. Okay. So when we compare it for the multi-wall nanotubes, uh, for this method versus other methods that are in the literature, first of all, what we see is that our percolation threshold is by far the lowest. But then on top of that, not only is that the lowest, but in terms of the maximum uh, conductivity that's achieved, it's also about two orders of magnitude higher. So we can get lower percolation threshold, and at the end, we get higher conductivity as well. So it's really quite, uh, quite a nice result. So when we start to look at okay, what's going on in these multi-well nanotubes and carbon nanotube, or co sorry, copper nanowire, uh, composites, when we take a look at the multi-wall nanotube, it may be hard for you to see, but these are all the little nanotubes here. You can see actually they are kind of distributed throughout the entire matrix. There's some agglomeration, but actually agglomeration is not a bad thing because if you actually distribute these materials too well, you distribute them so well that they aren't near each other, then you might have an excellent dispersion, but you'll have no conductivity. So what we don't want is the best dispersion, well, not the best, with the, you know, in terms of the highest dispersion, 
We want an optimum dispersion. We want them to be dispersed, but at the same time have enough connections that we can form this network. For the carbon, sorry, the copper nanowires, it was a co completely different type of structure like the one I showed before. So you have more of them attaching to each other and being segregated from the uh, polymer. But again, they also are, are capable of having uh, very low percolation thresholds. So when you get to EMI shielding, um, so this is what we want to uh, achieve with the product that we make. So with that structure, we want to be able to attenuate electromagnetic uh, waves. So when an electromagnetic wave comes, usually we'll have a shield in a cell phone, laptop, whatever else, where the material, when, when the wave comes in, the material will reflect it, or it can have some absorption of it, or it can internally reflect it, or it can transmit it. Of course, we don't want to transmit it. That's the key thing. So we want to reduce that to the lowest possible. So we usually is reported in the terms of a shielding effectiveness, where the shielding effectiveness is 10 times the log of the input power over the output power. So we want this uh, number to be high, so that let's say you take the log of this, um, this if this is like uh, you know, 0 0.01, um, sorry, it should be a negative here, I guess. So if this is like 0 0.01, no, that's right, no, sorry, I'm sorry, it's the other way around. So it's, if this is 100, then this would be um, 2, so that would be 20. So that would give us 20 decibels of protection. So that means that 1% of the of this EM wave is going through. If we have, this is 1 and this is, uh, say, 10,000, then, it's, it's, uh, then 10,000 means that this will be 40 decibels. So that means actually 0 0.0001, sorry, no, sorry, uh, the fraction is 0 0.0001 or 0.01% of the material or the, the wave is going through. So as the shielding effectiveness is higher and higher, we're actually having a log type of dependence of how much is going through. So when we do that for the uh, different um, uh, materials, this is the carbon nanotubes, what we did was we tried to vary the thickness of the sample. So we went from 0.4 millimeters up to 3 millimeters. Of course, you know, we want to have the thinnest samples possible, right, and still get the same type of shielding. I don't think there's anyone going around saying, you know what, I got the uh, uh, heaviest uh, iPad that was ever made. It's got the thickest walls for protection. You know, they always want thinner, lighter, so that's what we want. So we want to have the lighter, but we can see that the thickness does have an effect. So as you change uh, the concentration, there's an increase, but also as you change the thickness, you can see that there's an increase in EMI shielding. And what I'll mention is that over 20 decibels of protection is where we have interesting properties. You know, when we get to something like cell phones or something, we're probably in like the 50, 60, Beyond 60, we're looking at military applications, but around 20, we can start to use it in applications. Now, when we do the same type of uh, measurements with copper nanowires, what we see here is that uh, at uh, around 1%, so those, if you remember previously in the last one, we were getting to about 10% you know, concentration or 15%, you know, maybe five for the very thick samples where you get the good protection. Here, this is for the, th the thinnest sample. So these are the 0.4 millimeter samples. At 1%, we're already at the stage where we can start to look at using these. So, uh, sorry, this is not even 0.4, this is 0.2 millimeter. So it's actually half of the smallest thickness that I was showing in the previous plot. Typically, the thickness is about 10 times more to get the same type of uh, uh, application, same type of uh, protection. So we take a look at the EMI shielding now for these two different materials, the multi-wall nanotubes, polystyrene, copper nanowire, polystyrene. Again, you see the multi-wall starts earlier, and as you increase the thickness, you get to higher and higher values. This is for the 0.2 millimeter thickness. For the copper nanowires, you can see much higher, but then you have to wait to much uh, large, uh, higher concentrations before you can get the uh, electromagnetic interference shielding. So again, you can see where uh, about around 1% or so, it becomes interesting for us to start to look at uh, these materials for cell, well, not for, for cell phones, but for EMI applications. So the key thing here, first of all, is that it's 0.2 millimeter thickness, one tenth the thickness, and we're getting a, excellent protection. And the second thing is that we made these through this special method that we, uh, we had in the group, the MSMP method. We compared also uh, the, uh, cop the copper nanowire results with some other results for other materials reported in the literature. And what I'm showing here, this is the thickness of the sample. And uh, here's the different materials, the filler concentration, and then the final EMI shielding. And so if we take a look at some of these comparisons, if we look at the multi-wall nanotube and polystyrene versus the copper nanowire, you see that you know, for about one-fifth the thickness, the concentration is a little higher, but one-fifth the thickness, we actually get 
50% more EMI shielding. So with a much thinner sample, we're getting more shielding. And then again, if we look at the method itself, and we compare the uh, multi-wall nanotubes with this method versus the previous method, now instead of seven, we're using 2.5 uh, uh, weight percent in this case, and we see that the EMI shielding is almost the same for the same sample thickness. So using this method also is another advantage. Finally, one interesting thing that we saw was copper nanowires and polyethylene. Where polyethylene is the, uh, I don't know, it's like the, uh, the Ford or the, uh, the GM of polymers, right? So, I mean, it's very cheap and it's very prevalent and everybody, um, no, usually we don't look at it for these high-tech applications. But we see at even 7 weight percent concentration, at 0.2 millimeters thickness, we're getting 43 decibels, which is outstanding. And the reason that we believe that's occurring here and not in polystyrene PMMA or the other systems that we looked at is because polyethylene is crystalline. And what's going on is now not only are you having this structure where you have this exclusion of the uh, uh, nanowires from that inside drop, but you have a second exclusion from the crystalline phase, so that's only in the amorphous phase. So now you need to fill even less to be able to form that network and get the protection. So actually, again, the structure is quite important. Um, the other interesting thing that we uh, saw is that when we added carbon nanotubes and copper nanowires and did a high, or, or a mixture, uh, mixed type of filler system, we would expect kind of have a, an increase that's uh, linear or some type of you know, increasing. But what we saw is actually we were getting some samples where they, we had a maximum. So we would have kind of a minimum and then a maximum at a particular ratio of those. So we also studied the EMI shielding, and again, we see that there's some type of maximum that seems to be occurring around 75% uh, ratio, so of multi-wall nanotube and the 25% of the copper nanowires. And we looked at the uh, TEMs of those. What we see is that we actually form this kind of two network structure. So we have two tiers of networks. We have the copper nanowires, which are um, all aggregating together and forming this kind of honeycomb type of structure. And then in between them, we have these multi-wall nanotubes that are distributed throughout the entire matrix. So because the copper nanowires have this initial matrix, and now we have additional multi-wall nanotubes that are making connections where there may not be connections by distributing throughout the entire matrix, this double network actually allows us to have a more optimum structure and a better conductivity than just one material by itself. So maybe I'll just finish here by saying, uh, first of all, the, the one important point is that when we do these experiments, it's very important that we have something on the miniature scale that matches the larger scale. So if we do some stuff on the miniature scale that has no relevance to the large scale, it doesn't mean anything because then when you start try to make something out of it, it won't work. Um, the machines that we showed showed some uh, excellent mixing and we were able to create these uniform conductive nanowires using this porous template method, using porous aluminum oxide. And then using those plus the uh, carbon nanotubes, we were able to get these conductive nanocomposites uh, with very low concentrations using the, what we call the miscible solvent uh, mixing method and uh, mixing precipitation method. And what we said is that above about 0.8 volume percent, we now have the ability to make EMI shielding products. So that's all you need for these copper nanowires to be able to get above that 20 decibels. Finally, we also showed that there was this optimum concentration of the 7525. So by again, by mixing different fillers, we may get other additional benefits by this uh, double network formulation. So I'll just stop by saying to thank NSERC for a strategic uh, program, which funded a lot of this work, and also for Nova Chemicals and EI DuPont for not only the materials that they provided, but allowing us to use a lot of their equipment for some of this work. So thank you very much for uh, pitching. So I'm sure Dr. Sundarite would be prepared to take questions. Yes, thank you. Um, I'll let it. Go ahead. So you showed your uh, nanocomposite has superior shielding to other products, but do you know how the actual physical properties? Yeah, so this is actually one thing that we really felt, uh, you know, by adding, say, a copper nanowire, to the uh, polymer that, you know, things like tensile strength and so on would, would also be uh, enhanced. And so, especially since they're nanomaterials, we did the experiments, and same with the carbon nanotubes, did the tensile and so on, and there was obviously some increase in tensile modulus, tensile strength, but we could have added just, you know, uh, micron-sized particles and get the same effect. So, um, as long as they have the same type of aspect ratio. So we really didn't see anything special about it, but it does increase. It is a little better. Somewhere in here, I do have a plot of the tensile 
uh, data and so on, but it's nothing uh, extraordinary. So yes, there is better mechanical properties, but nothing special because it's nano. Is that? Uh, I have a couple questions on the copper deposition part. Yes. Um, so how do you, uh, you're filling into aluminum oxide, which is an insulator. How do you make the electrical from the yeah, I didn't get into that, but uh, essentially we have, uh, w this is part of why, you know, if you have DC, what you need to do is actually, you know, have open pores. But in this case, what we do is we have um, a barrier layer at the bottom, and we just, you know, slowly uh, take away that barrier layer, layer slowly by, uh, you know, using uh, electrical methods until it's very thin, and then we actually, you know, there's enough uh, conductivity there to start then depositing from the bottom, and then it grows from there. Yeah. The other question, do you have trouble um, filling that completely with open voids for me? So that's a, I mean, in, in the industry, that's a big problem with the um, larger features than what you would like, maybe 100 nanometers, mm -hmm. down to size. Yeah, so what we did is we had to optimize uh, the process. Um, there's some work uh, that's shown with the DOE that you know, uses different uh, processing conditions. So the ones that we're using are the optimum conditions. So what we did was after we made the template, we then you know, microtome that so that we could see the actual fibers inside the template itself or the wires inside the template to see what the growth was. So at the optimum conditions, we had fairly good filling, so they were between 75 to 100% filled. But uh, in terms of voids, um, we didn't see so much at these conditions. But if you didn't have the optimum conditions, you could have like some pores that are zero and others that are full. Yeah. So. Yes. Uh, I have a question. First thing is that you mentioned for your uh, copper and silver nanowire, you did a surface functionalization. So which kind of surface functionalization you did? And okay. Right, so uh, this is very interesting because I didn't present it because, uh, so what we did is we did some uh, thiol, first we did thiols with alkane thiols. We did C4, C8, C20, C18 I think, C18. We did all these different thiols and then we did the mixing and I tell you the dispersion was beautiful. All the particles were all distributed nicely everywhere and then when we did all the measurements what we found is that we had no conductivity at all. Partly because we had better dispersion, but secondly, we had this insulative layer of this, uh, al you know, this um, uh, alkane, or this, you know, that's basically not. And we thought with C4, shouldn't be an issue. But then we saw also that there were actually uh, multi layers that were forming. We weren't really forming monolayers. C18 maybe we were, but when we got to the lower alkanes, that actually they were forming multiple layers, and so we actually had these nicely distributed conductive nanoparticles that were perfectly insulated. So it didn't help us. But the other functionalizations that we've done is to use either conductive uh, polymer nanocomposite, uh, sorry, conductive polymers as coatings, and also uh, we've done hybrids of, say, silver and copper because copper tends to oxidize more. So having a thin layer of silver on the outside as well is another um, approach that we've taken. But uh, when we use alkanes or anything non-conductive, then basically we get poor electrical properties. Should. It can, yeah. Well, the EMI shielding, see, the, the interesting thing about EMI shielding is there's a lot of theory about EMI shielding, and really what it says is that you don't need to have a network necessarily formed to have good EMI shielding. You just need the surface to be available when the waves come to have that reflection, absorption, whatever occur. But in most of the literature, it, and it's sh is shown that you have to have the conductivity before you can get the EMI shielding. So, um, you know, I don't, I, it's not necessarily that they're related. And on top of that, for example, like the intrinsically conductive polymers like PANI and so on have been shown to be very good absorbers for the EMI shielding, whereas the metals are very good reflectors. So perhaps by combining the effects of those, you can get both mechanisms to work inside. So I think the EMI shielding um, development, it, it's somewhat related to the electrical conductivity, but it's also separate in terms of the mechanisms. So it's not the same, but in general, most people report you have to have conductivity first before you can get EMI shielding, but there's not really good uh, theoretical descriptions of why. Thanks. The, you have, I saw you uh, report the data you show is you can reach your 20 percentage, weight percentage of the carbon nanotube in the polymer. And that data, I feel, is very impressive. So this carbon nanotube, did you also apply uh, surface, func surface functionalization? Or uh, well, also use the same uh, mini tool you mentioned. 
Well, no. Okay. Well, first of all, uh, the car carbon nanotubes for, we can buy them at 15 weight percent very easily, or even 20 weight percent very easily from from industry. So we can buy that quite oh, easily. Batch. No, my master batch. The master batches we made were actually made at Nova. Um, so we went to Nova and we used their machine, which has a stuffer, and uh, you know we can make sure that the pressure is high and there's a seal. So when the material goes in, it, it can get dispersed quite well. Uh, so the Machine was a 30 millimeter, no, it's either the 25 millimeter mega that they had or the 30 millimeter. I'm pretty sure, but anyway, around 100 to 200 pound per hour type of throughput. And then we uh, took that sample and then diluted it down and then injection molded and did other things with it. Yeah, so it was uh, done, yeah, just with extrusion. There was uh, nothing special in terms of functionalization, no. So the viscosity, though? I mean, viscosity is high, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, it's uh, this is one of the problems. You know, when you make some of these nano composites, that's why I talked about the concentrations. When you get to high concentration of these nano materials, I mean, you might as well be extruding bricks. You know, like they're just they're just solid, and so that's an issue. So that's why I'm, I'm really talk about the processing being important. That we need to lower that concentration. Otherwise, you're going to be you may have a great material that you can't do anything with it. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, how do you think the fact that these the nano are polypristin rather than single prism. How does that affect the Well, you know, it would be nice if we could have the comparison. Um, but the unfortunate thing is when we go to the smaller scales, when we've done this, we've always had polycrystalline. Now, when we make larger scale, like, well, sorry, large, larger diameter, like say around 200 nanometers, because we can modify this, we can make the single crystal. But then the aspect ratio is different. So we haven't been able to make a comparison. But I think, you know, it should be hopefully better if we can have um, a single crystal, though we haven't done the actual experiment. Has anyone, have you seen papers where they... Yeah, well, most of this, the problem is that you can't get, at least as far as I've seen, this kind of size scale, a single crystal, larger scale you can. And uh, there, is public, there are publications and they do have pretty good um, results, but not at, as, as low a percolation threshold or like 0.25 or lower. So, you know, it's a hard comparison in terms of, you know, what are you really looking for? But, um, the MSMP method, in terms of those concentrations, we're getting, we're approaching the metal conductivities with that. And the reason is because of that structure. Because it's almost like it's almost purely a metal because that's all the electrons see as it goes through. And so it's almost like you're filling that polymer with, you know, 70, 80 uh, percent filler. But it ha actually happens to be only 0.25, but arranged in a certain fashion. So that's really that morphology, that structure, that's quite important. So um, I think you can get to those types of levels that we're seeing, uh, maybe even higher when you're using single crystal, but unless you can get to this size scale and with this method, you're not going to be able to get at the lower concentration that same effect. Yeah. Thanks. Say it again. Okay, well, there's a few different ways. So uh, we have, uh, you know, one, we make a disc, um, I think it's about 10 centimeter diameter. Then we just have the contacts on the top and the bottom, and we can, you know, go through that. The other one, uh, for smaller samples, we have four point probe. Um, so those are the two main ones, like Keatley uh, power source, and then just kind of the home belt. And the other one is uh, Loresta, is the machine that we use for the four point probe. Sorry? The result of saying? Well, when we show the, the plots here, you know, for the different ranges of conductivity, we're using two different machines. It would be best to get, you know, the, not the surface resistivity, but the, the bulk. But, you know, because of the sample size and also the level of conductivity, sometimes we're reporting the surface. It seems to match pretty well in terms of the, the percolation. But usually it's during that percolation that it's occurring. So it's not like a shift of, you know, 0.1% or something, maybe it's a 0, 0.0 something percent, maybe there could be a shift between the surface and the bulk. Um, so yeah, that, that is, uh, we do use two different methods. So yeah, so we are me reporting some surface in here. Yeah. So, uh, can you mix up the operator on the nitrogen? Sorry, if you can mix, mix up. Yes. Can the operator on the nitrogen? Under nitrogen? Um, yeah, we've done, especially with the mini batch mixer, it's quite easy because you can have like a nitrogen, uh, there's a little, uh, uh, just a, you know, like a nozzle that uh, can be connected to a nitrogen tank and that keeps it under a nitrogen atmosphere. But the other one, the APAM, yeah, we really don't have that capability. But, you know, you can put a nitrogen blanket around it, but it's not 100%. You're always going to have some, some leakage there. Yeah. 
<coughs> and also, uh, uh, so, so you have not used the rubber part? Rubber? Yeah. In that mixer? Yeah. Yeah, we have. We use quite a bit. We use a lot of floral elastomers. I didn't present the project that we have on uh, trying to, we're trying to make some floral elastomer materials for uh, pumps to be used in oil fields. And uh, in a lot of oil field applications, they now, everything in Alberta is heavy oil these days. So you got to get, you know, the oil is also not quite a brick, but it's really thick. So to try and move it is very hard. So they usually add steam or something else, thermal methods to heat up the oil. But then to try and pump it, now you need you know, different materials. You can't use like a polypropylene or something in there. So we're trying to do the floral elastomers, which work at the temperature, but then are too soft to work as pumps or you know, in, um, in, in our seals or as anything. So what we do is then we add some nano clays that are functionalized. We functionalize the nano clay, especially for floral elastomer, and we do that mixing inside these mixers. Yeah, I'm, I'm, just, so I'm just trying to discuss with you the conductivity. Oh, for conductivity? Yeah. For, rub oh, for elastomers? Yeah. Yeah, we haven't done any of the curing studies or anything like that with uh, conductivity. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't know if it wouldn't be stable. I'm, I mean, there's lots of, uh, uh, obviously, materials out there using carbon black with elastomers, so um, we just haven't studied it with our materials specifically, usually because carbon black tends to work in those and they're pretty cheap, but it'll be interesting to look at it. We haven't looked at elastomers or thermosets in very much detail. We mostly worked with thermoplastics. Yeah, but the, the vulcanization, vulcanization kinetics can obviously change the structure as well. So it might be quite interesting, but we haven't done it. And last question. Is it transparent? Your, your material is transparent? Uh, okay, this is a good question. Yeah, it's very interesting. Um, so we made one material that's somewhat transparent, and the one material is the polyethylene. And you'll say, well, polyethylene is not transparent. But what happens also is once you add the nanowires, so not only are the nanowires getting shifted by the crystal structure, the crystal structure is being affected by the nanowires. So we're actually creating crystals that are now below the wavelength of light so we can make polyethylene nanocomposites with the copper nanowires that you can be able to read you know, the summary through. So uh, that's very recent things that we have. We, have to, we haven't published that, but it's, uh, yeah, it's possible. Yeah, but that's the only one. The other materials, we, we, once we add a lot of material, it winds up being opaque. Even at like 1%. No more questions, and I'd ask you to join me in thanking Dr. Sundaraj for her.